Rogue access point attacks, but more like like more on the defensive side. Uh, I mean, we go into some of the offensive stuff, but I, I mean, pretty much a lot of that's already been done before. Uh, this is uh, more of a talk on how to like identify rogue AP attacks and also how to uh, some preventative measures that you can use to uh, to mitigate them. Um, I'm Gabriel Ryan. I'm a security engineer at Gotham Digital Science. Uh, we do like pen testing and uh, uh, secure source review stuff like that. So we're gonna be talking about like two kinds of rogue AP attacks today. We're gonna be talking about the evil twin attack and the karma attack. Uh, so let's talk about evil twin attacks. So um, suppose we're sitting downstairs and we're all connected to one of the legitimate access points for DEF CON open network, you know, for example. Um, and and the, that's running on, well, that access point is running on channel six and it uh, has the SSID set to uh, DEF CON open uh, Wi-Fi or whatever, whatever it is. If we were to spin up our own hotspot and you know, with the same SSID in the same channel, how would, how would our connected laptops be able to tell the difference between uh, the legitimate access point and the one we just created? Well, it's kind of a trick question because actually they can't. Uh, the, the, the factor that is used in, in that scenario is uh, whatever, uh, what, whatever access point has the, the better signal strength and the better signal to noise ratio, that is what gets connected to. So you know, if, if we were to, to do this, um, and if we were to set up our own access point with uh, the same SSID and channel, and boost our TX, so it was just ever so slightly um, better than the legitimate access point, uh, all these uh, wireless clients would drop their connections from the legitimate one and connect to us. And when this happens, we essentially have the perfect recreate the access point and then route it out to the internet and capture everything in between. So um, there's some pretty like obvious advantages to this attack. I mean, one of them is that it's like really easy to perform. Uh, you just need something that's capable of making a hotspot. Um, it's also really hard to detect, and uh, we'll go over this a bit later. And it's also very tar targeted. If you're working in a red team situation and you only want to attack a specific network, this is really good because by default, this kind of attack only targets an access point on, on, on the network that you're intending to. So if your scope is limited to you know, DEF CON open, for example, uh, and, and you spin up a hotspot for DEF CON open, you're probably only going to get clients that are, that are connected to the, to the target that's in scope. Uh, disadvantages, well, I mean, for one thing, it doesn't work out of the box against like uh, protected networks. So if you have like a WPA protected network or something like that, uh, it's unless you have that pre-shared key, which presumably if you're doing this, you probably don't. Um, unless you have that pre-shared key, you're not actually going to uh, um, have a lot of luck. Uh, the way you get around this is by, you know, basically, so we're in the wireless village. Uh, I'm assuming you guys, okay, so show of hands, who does not know how? Of, of that access point gets stored into an ordered list in your, um, basically in, 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 your, in your device that is called your preferred networks list. And your device is constantly sending out probe requests to see if any of these preferred networks that you've currently, that you previously connected to are nearby. And if they are, um, you'll automatically connect to it. So what we can do in this situation is that we can sniff for packets, uh, for probe request packets from devices that are currently connected to the target network. Uh, we can identify one that a lot of them have in common then we can de-auth the target network while simultaneously, you know, running a rogue AP that is of that, um, that, that matches that preferred network. And all these devices, when they drop off the de-auth network, they'll connect to us instead. But it's a little more complicated, which is kind of why it's not so great against uh, protected networks. So how do we detect evil twin attacks? Well, I mean, for one thing, we can use uh, whitelisting. So, you know, you can, you can the, the, the standard way to do this is just to, uh, uh, you know, keep an inventory of like what access points are belong to your network. So if you have have a BSS ID that is not belonging to your whitelist, it's not on your whitelist then at that point you know that something, you know, something shady is going on. So for example, you know, this guy is, is saying, uh, you know, I have the ESSID Starbucks and your IDS system picks this up and checks the whitelist and it's not there, so the VSSID is not there, so you just you know, take action accordingly. So this doesn't always work because a motivated attacker can simply um, you know, use like arrow dump or something like that to create a list of all the, you know, to basically figure out what are all the valid VSSIDs 
for your wireless network. So at that point, you just it's, it's pretty easy to just spit up an AP that has the BSSID matching one of your, your, your legitimate access points as well, uh, not just the SSID and channel. So this actually makes evil twins really hard to detect. Um, the way we get around this is by paying attention to signal strength, however. So you know, if I have an access point sitting up here, like in the front of the room, right, and we have like a packet sniffer, like you know, chilling over there in the corner, the uh, signal strength from 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 my access point to that packet sniffer uh, should not change very much. You know, it, it should stay like within a provided you know, and, and of course you know, with like interference and stuff like this, this doesn't always hold true. But um, provide in most cases, it should stay within a certain within a, th a certain threshold. So what this means is that. You know, if, if we if we um, if we establish a baseline uh, TX value from our packet sniffer to uh, um, to our access point, you know, and 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 um, then then listen for probe requests um, or probe responses, should I say, uh, from from the uh, claim to come from our access point that have the, the BSSID, ESSID, and 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 same channel as one of our legi legitimate access points, but there's a t TX value that is really noticeably different uh, from our legitimate access point, then we know that it's probably that it's probably a, uh, uh, a rogue AP. So, quick demo of how that this works. Uh, I'm actually going to spin up. Please don't sue me, DefCon. Uh, so we're going to right here. I'm the, so I'm spinning up a, a server here, and there's going to be a web interface on here, and we're going to see like an alert pop up when this happens. And now we're starting up our packet sniffer, and it's just kind of chilling here, and. If the demo gods are merciful, when I, when I spin up this uh, this ro this pseudo rogue access point, we should see something. Ah, yes, here it is. So we have the alert show up on the screen. So this is like a really really cheap way to easily spot these uh, rogue AP attacks, and it literally can be done in like a few lines of uh, of Python code. So I'm going to kill host APD really fast because it's not it's not quitting. <laughs> All right. So karma attacks. So the second kind, and this is actually like the later evolution of your rogue AP attack, is the karma attack. Uh, remember how we mentioned that you know all of your 802.11 uh, devices, um, you know, constantly send out probe requests uh, for networks that are on their preferred networks list. Well, so there are two ways they um, they approach this. You know, um, in, in some cases, you know, um, the the better way for devices to do this is for them to listen passively uh, for probe response for probe responses coming from nearby access points. Um, unfortunately, there are still a lot of clients out there that actively actually will, will, will broadcast their, a lot of clients that will broadcast their existence by, by actively probing for nearby access points. So um, what this means is that you know, if we set up a rogue access point um, or, or some kind of access point and just have it you know, gratuitously respond to every single probe request that it receives. So for example, you know, I'm the access point and you know, some, some client over there uh, send, you know, sends out a probe request for, uh, for, for Linksys. And you know, if I if I just if I see that and I respond, uh, you know, saying yeah, I'm Linksys, uh, go ahead and connect. That device will automatically connect, you know. And then you know, if if, if from the same access point we send out another uh, another probe, you know, we, we receive another probe request for a different ESSID, you know, AT and T Wi-Fi, and the rogue AP sends out a, a probe request. Uh, or for, um, the rogue AP actually sends a response to that uh, for AT and T Wi-Fi. Then the second client will connect as well. So what you have is a situation where you have a single rogue uh, single access point. That is responding to every single probe request that it receives, regardless of whether or not uh, it's a probe request for itself or it, or some or some other thing. Um, so the you know this is the kind of attack that you often see like with a lot of these. I, I can't really name brand names, but uh, for example, these very fruity uh, kind of like tropical looking fruit name devices that you <laughs> tend to buy at, um, at 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 security conferences. This is how they work. You know, you just set one up and then you just listen for probe requests and. Uh, and respond to all of them, and then the device thinks that it's a legitimate AP and connects. Um, and as as those of you who may have purchased these devices, you may know it's a relatively automatic process. You turn it on, the script runs, and you just start pointing the shit out of everything nearby. Um, uh, so they're they're fast. You know, there's minimal supervision or recon required, um, and you can still target uh, nearby APs. The problem with these kinds of attacks is that they're really easy to spot. And you know, because I've been in Vegas all week, and you know, I've been in a lot of bars, I'm gonna use a bar analogy. Um, so suppose that you walk into a bar, and you know you're, you're looking for this dude named Jake. So like you, you walk into the bar and you say, "Hey, is anyone here named Jake?" And then some like sketchy dude with a ski mask and a DefCon badge stands up in the back and is like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm Jake." So you might be actually inclined to believe him because like, you know, why would this guy be making this up? Well, let's rewind a bit and suppose that we're in the business of of, of bullshit detection. So you know, <laughs> all right. So you know, this time we have a little notepad, a pen and paper with us. We walk into the bar and say, "Hey, is anybody here named Jake?" 
you know, sketchy guy in the DEF CON badge stands up and asserts that his name is Jake. You write down his, okay, yeah, that guy says he's Jake. Immediately step back out of the bar and you step back into the bar and say, is anybody here named Katie? And Jake says, now is saying that he's Katie. Well, the, the same principle can be applied to rogue access points. You know, if, if you see, if you send out a probe request uh, for, for some random hash string and you get a response, well, I mean, that, that itself should tell you that something shady is going on. You know, like if, if I'm looking for ESSID, oh, whatever that says on the, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't receive, resp you know, a probe response for it. But, you know, suppose we do. Okay, we can go with that. We send another one for, for a second, you know, randomized hash string. Well, I mean, when that happens, if we, if we, if we get a single ID, a single, you know, piece of hardware responding for both of these, that's probably a good indication that, you know, it resembles one of these Citrus-like devices that we've been seeing a lot. And that, in that case, uh, you can try to locate it or deauth it or whatever. So, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the demo for that one. Also, I don't have a pineapple. Can't say that. Um, yeah, you know what I mean. With me. Um, but let's talk about some like existing solutions to like you know preventing and detecting rogue IP attacks. So um, Aruba Networks makes this thing called an Airwave. Uh, last I checked the price list, it's like three thousand bucks, and it's awesome, and it can detect a lot of this stuff. Um, Unfortunately, it's a little out of the, the reach of, of, of the kind of uh, network admin that is going to be the target of this. You know, you know prime, if, if I want to steal like 50 credit card numbers or 50, 500 credit card numbers, I'm not going to be going after an enterprise network. I'm going to be setting up in a coffee, ch coffee shop, you know, in, 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 in Harlem or something like that and, and, and seeing, seeing who I can, or, or on the subway and seeing like, you know, who I can actually ensnare that way. Um, you know, Cisco makes uh, uh, another really, really awesome product. Actually, in the references of these slides, which I'm going to be releasing online, there's a reference to their, uh, to the, to their, to their, uh, their slick sheet about like how these things work, and it's frankly genius. But they're also like probably out of the price range of your, of of, of the kind of network admin that's going to be working on a network um, uh, that's going to be the target of this kind of thing. So and the same is true with the fluke, uh, with, with with the other example of this. Uh, you know, Fluke Networks, they, they have an analyzer that is like 4,000 bucks for a software license. It's great, once again, but it's not really something that, you know, your, your, uh, your, your, typical, your, your typical network admin is going to be able to afford. So, um, I think the thing to do is to ask ourselves, what are the bare minimum resources needed for effective rogue AP mitigation? So, if you, if you, ha if you have to run an open Wi-Fi network, um, case in point, actually, we did this at B-Sides. Uh, earlier during the week. This is pretty much how we handle our, our wireless security. But if you have to run an, an effective, um, um, you know, if you have to open, or bleh, if you have to open, <laughs> if you have to run an, uh, an open Wi-Fi network, and um, you know you, you need to provide rogue AP protection, you know, how do you do this? What is the minimum cost here? And frankly, you know, using using these algorithms that we just described. Uh, you can do this with, you know, uh, just a Raspberry Pi and, you know, about 500 lines of Python code, a um, little more if you want to get into fancy client server stuff, and just like a cheap, like, $10 TP-Link adapter, and that, that should pretty much cover it. So that brings the cost of rogue AP protection down to about 45 bucks, you know, per unit. So if you, um, one other thing, I mean, this, if, if you know math, statistics, or physics really well, that, that TX single strength thing that we did earlier, I mean, it works pretty well, but like, it's not great. It was built using pretty much hacker math. Um, but if you know math math and, and they want to contribute to this project, uh, <laughs> you know, feel free to send out a, an email to research at gdssecurity.com because we'd love to actually have someone who can do math uh, helping with this. Um, and if you want to mess around with the source code, uh, it's at github.com slash solstice slash sentry gun and you can get the server, which the client thing he's talked to, at uh, solstice slash sentry guns dash server. And uh, there will be a readme up there in an hour. <laughs> and um, that's it, basically. Any Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? So the, the TP-Link uh, TLWN722N is a uh, external Wi-Fi adapter that you can that you can get on uh, on Amazon. It's just one of many that pretty much do the same thing, but it's it's basically an external network adapter that can. Uh, it's really good at sniffing packets. What's that, dude? Um, is that saying uh, when you need two cards, is that middle uh, in the middle of the circuit, or is that saying you use the same card for sniffing and DR? So. 
I when I when we started working on this initially, I, I kind of thought that you'd need two separate cards for sniffing a D off. Turns out you don't. All right. I, with the Atheris cards, I, with the uh, with the ones I plugged in right here, actually you do, and I, I don't know why. <laughs> It's multi-channel. See, this guy knows Wi-Fi. I know Python, so it's. <laughs> What's up, dude? Could you do this one with, uh, with a Mac, like just filter? With the with the with the leave me on OS X. Uh, I don't know. I mean, most of this is hand rolled. I, it's running on Linux. I, I don't I don't think so. But don't quote me on it. Any any other questions? What's up? Yeah. Good question. Good question. So, um, and, and, and this question comes up a lot. So, uh, the question he asked, it's a really good one, is why don't you just change your BSSID between probe requests or probe response? And you can do that, but remember that if, you're, if the entire attack revolves around you spinning up a, a rogue access point and, and, and somebody connecting to you, in order to maintain that connection, in order to, to actually have a valid AP, you need a valid BSSID. So, if you're constantly changing your BSSID, this kind of becomes a problem because how do you you know handle all these people connecting to you and then you can only have a BSSID up for more than you know a little bit and you know not to mention each time that you change your BSSID you pretty much have to like take the you know you, have to, you pretty much have to bring the whole network uh, interface down change it restart the software bring it back up again and you know it's it's just kind of like pretty much unfeasible I, you know I had someone actually tell me that it, it sounds as if like there's probably a way to do it with SDR I don't know because I don't know SDR um, but you know, as of right now, like, it's pretty much, uh, if you want to go down that route, a uh, better approach would be to just kind of, like, you know, actually go with the evil twin and just try, try to, like, intelligently, you know, find, find a, uh, a bunch of, uh, pretty much like a, like a common network that a lot of people nearby have connected to, and it will pretty much have a similar effect. Anything else? What's up, man? Yes. Um, so you mean you mean have some way of, of, uh, of so have an evil twin that is able to f figure out what the the, the threshold. Yeah. You, it's time for a long attack where you yeah. The, that that is the problem. So you know, for example, if you if you do want to look for it this way, um, if if you start, so there is this calibration phase that this thing has to use, and if if you're able to, you know, send out your own packets during that thing, yeah, it's going to mess it up. That's the problem with baseline. You got to know your baseline is, is um, yeah, not perverted. Right. So it it actually becomes a bit of a phys uh, like a physical security problem at that point. You know, if you're, for example, like what we did at B sides whole building was pretty much closed off, you know, we calibrated it and then let everybody in. But if you're not able to do that, you know, if it, you can't, you can't really do it on the fly. Uh, one thing that, that's been talked about is, is uh, instead of like using, to, you know, like uh, establishing a statistical norm to like maybe use, you know, like some kind of uh, um, uh, machine learning or something like that to kind of figure it out. But then again, you, I mean, machine learning algorithms are still, you know, prone to poisoning. So that's a, that's another issue. So. Awesome question. <laughs> What's up? So, uh, in the system, what about sending a known good packet from the wired side of the network out, but when you record that packet, you never transmit it? That's, that's also a really good idea. Actually, do you want to? So, so, what he asked is, is why not send a known good packet out and then listen for that, and then you, you know the transmit? Um, and, and you can, you can kind of like listen for the packet that you just sent out and, and, and record that. And this is an open source project, so if you want to add that. <laughs> um, any, anything else? What's up? I, I never feel safe. <laughs> any, any other questions? Am I missing, or is that it? All right. Well, uh, yeah, that's... <laughs>